subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Joy Learning. And then I'm always your science teacher, Ko Opoku. Like I always say, it's going to be a new, different topic altogether. And I hope you sit, relax, and enjoy this time. Before we go to today's business, I gave you an assignment, a couple of questions that I expected you to find answers to them. So let's run through them and get our answers right. The first question that I gave you was, what are metals? When somebody should ask you what a metal is, how will you explain it or what will be your answer? You said metals are elements that readily give out electrons to form ions. So when we say something is a metal, it means that it has the ability of giving out electrons in their valence shell so that it can form ions. So metals will readily give out electrons. It can be one or two, so electron or electrons to form ions. Now let's look at some of the examples of these metals. We have sodium, we have calcium, we have potassium, we have magnesium, and then we have aluminum. There are other ones that would, would have or we would be in the periodic table. But at this juncture, I gave you two. When I said I gave you two, I mean I expected you to give me two examples. And here I've given you more than two. So you can choose to go for any of them. And then if your answers were any of these, then my brother, you are my sister, you are truly right. Now let's go to, because I was actually asking you different between metals and non-metals. So now let's see what then is a non-metal. Non-metals, on the other hand, are elements that receive electrons to form ions. Non-metals are substances or elements that would receive or gain electrons to form ions. So you should always have in mind that metals will give out electron or electrons to form ions. Non-metals, on the other hand, would rather receive or gain electrons to form ions. Now, these are some of the examples of non-metals. We have sulfur, we have nitrogen, we have oxygen, we have fluorine, and then we have silicon. So these are the examples of non-metals. I also gave you question two as finding some of the physical properties of metals. When you see a metal, what will tell you that this is a metal? Or what are the things that you'd have to look out for physically to be able to determine that this or that is a metal? We have metals have higher boiling point and melting point. So it simply means that when you want to heat or you want to actually melt any metal, it will actually take so much time before you can get them in their molten state. So it takes longer in getting them in their molten state. So it's either melting or boiling point. So they take so much heat before they can be melted or they take so much heat before they can boil. Another one is that metals are also lustrous. And I explained to you the last time that when we say a metal, when you say that metals are lustrous, it simply means that metals have shiny surfaces. For example, when you, when you see a nice or a new roofing sheet, aluminum roofing sheet, and the sun is scorching so high, are you sure you can look on the roofing sheet when the sun is scorching on it? You can't because it reflects the light back into your eyes. So every metal in its newer stage is lustrous or are lustrous. Third one is metals are good conductors of heat and electricity. Metals will always allow light and heat to pass through them. That is one property of metal. They also say that metals are malleable. It means they can be hammered and then altered into different shapes. They can be hammered and altered or changed into different shapes. So that is also about that. I also gave you a question like, give two chemical properties of metals. Two chemical properties of metal. I gave you four 
chemical properties and I expect you to give only two out of the four. So I have here, reactive metals react with water to produce hydrogen gas and basic oxide. And I always told you that whenever you are talking about chemical properties of metals and that you don't support your um, point with any chemical formula or equation, then it means that your point doesn't hold water. It is weak. So when we say that, Reactive metals react with water to produce hydrogen gas and the basic oxide. Then we can have this as a chemical formula. So the metal here, we have a metal here and then we have water that is giving us a product of metal hydroxide and the hydrogen gas. Now what is the metal here? The metal here is calcium that has been reacted or come together with water to give us calcium hydroxide and then we have hydrogen gas as also another product so the reactants are calcium and water coming together and they're giving us calcium hydroxide and then hydrogen gas the other one is reactive metals react with dilute hydrochloric acid to produce hydrogen gas and salt so whenever any metal reacts with hydrochloric acid which is diluted it is not concentrated diluted the reactant or the product that are going to be obtained from that is hydrogen gas and then salt and then we have the chemical formula here as magnesium reacting with hydrochloric acid and then giving a salt which is known as ma magnesium chloride and then hydrogen gas now we have other examples here we have examples like calcium Hydro hydrochloric acid that is giving us calcium chloride and then so we have plenty of these examples here now the third one is reactive metals are metals that do not show any signs on them when they react or come into contact with atmospheric oxygen water and an acid so these are the kind of metals that will always show signs whenever they find themselves or they are in the presence of water acids and then oxygen and all these are called reactive metals so they react to these substances that is the water the acid and then the oxygen and for this reason reactive metals are not used in the jewelry industry because how do you feel when you buy a gold necklace and only to realize that you had a bit of sweat because you had to run or walk under scorching sun and then this gold necklace is just changing its color or just losing its luster so what actually pulled you to buy that is no more available it has lost its luster okay so for this reason like i told you earlier that is why reactive metals are not used in the jewelry industry all right let's go to the other question that made us to know or discuss what are then non-metals non-reactive metals are metals which do not show any sign of reactivity when they are exposed to water acid and the atmospheric oxygen so here let's talk about some of the examples of these non-reactive metals we have examples as zinc even though these ones are not in the first 20 element as you may have learned that these ones are actually outside that but then unfortunately or fortunately we don't have so much of the non-reactive metals in the first 20 element so we have zinc we have gold we have copper and then the likes you may have titanium you may have platinum and the other one so all these um are actually used in the jewelry industry because they are non-reactive metals even when they come into contact with acid water or oxygen they don't have or they don't show any sign on them that is why these ones are commonly used in the jewelry industry okay now let's go back to the topic for today and today 
we are learning something quite different but then it's actually in line with metals when you see these different uh, metals um showcase on your screen i am sure you'll be able to take a wild guess and know what topic we'll be discussing today as you can see we are, you are, we are seeing brass you see aluminium cast iron copper steel metal sledge and then bronze so when you have all these displayed on your screens, then what then do you think is the topic for today? Are you guessing right? Okay. The topic for today is no other than alloy. Alloy. Okay. So let's look at what we want to achieve by the end of today's lesson. We want to explain the term alloy to list five examples of alloys write short notes on these alloys and these are stainless steel bronze duralumin and brass under the following headings so we will write something under these alloys and the following are the composition of these alloys the properties of these alloys and then the uses of those alloys then number four, explain the terms corrosion and rusting of metals. So we would have to know or differentiate between what corrosion is and then what rusting is. And then also conduct an experiment to demonstrate the process of rusting of iron. How are we going to do that? Just watch and see. All right. What then is an alloy? An alloy is a mixture of two or more metals and then a metal or another metal. So it simply means that you have two metals being brought together to form an alloy. Or you have a non-metal and then a different metal coming together to form an alloy. Basically, when you have these, what you have to do is that you must first get them in their molten state. Molten state, I'm talking about getting them in their liquid form. We spoke about some of the properties of metals as having high melting and boiling point so it means that you must heat these metals and get them in their liquid form as you get these two different metals in their liquid forms you now pour one on the other stir it gently mix them properly and then an alloy is formed or found that is how an alloy is formed all right now alloys show properties that may be different from the individual component of either the metal or the non-metal I'm just saying that whenever you say alloys, an alloy will have property that is quite different from the individual component that were brought together in forming the alloy. So if this is an alloy, it means that the property of this hand will be super duper different from an alloy of say this hand. Let's say I have this to be an aluminum, I have this to be a brass. Now compare the two in terms of say, rusting or corrosion it simply means that this would be able to stand so much uh, conditions that will be available for rusting to be so this one will take quite longer as compared to you having the other one which is the aluminium now the alloy form is of more quality in terms of the strength and also has a higher ability to withstand corrosion more than the individual metals or non-metal that formed the alloy and this is what I was talking about, whereby the metal or the non-metal must be obtained or must be made in the molten state. So this is what you see here, where the metal is now in a liquid form. You can clearly see that it's been heated for so many hours, and then it is just hot. So they pour it somewhere, and then they add it up, and then an alloy is formed. Now let's go straight into knowing some examples or some alloys, compositions that form those alloys, the properties of those alloys, and then what those alloys can actually be used for. So the first on the table is stainless steel. Stainless steel. I know stainless steel is common when it comes to cutlery. I know you may have seen a couple of cutlery, nine, four spoons here and there, that are actually made up from stainless steel. All right, now let's go into knowing the composition. What actually comes together to form stainless steel? 
The composition of stainless steel here are we have iron, we have chromium, and then we have carbon. Unfortunately, when you look at all these elements, the common one that is very common to you because that is the only one in the first 20 element is um, carbon. Iron and chromium are not in the first 20 element. So the composition of stainless steel include iron, chromium, and then carbon. Now, what are the properties of stainless steel? So it is just similar to a mild steel or the normal steel, and it does not go through rusting. So stainless steel products do not go through rusting, or it takes so long a time before you can have rust on them. So they have a very, very high strength that is able to rest. Now, what are they used for? Stainless steel are used for making surgical equipment and they are also used for making ornament. And then they can also be used for cutlery. The spoons, the knife, the fork, and then all that. So this is a typical example of stainless steel cutlery on, the, on this side, as you can see on screen. And then on the other side, on the right side is an ornament that is made from stainless steel. And one funny thing is because of the presence of iron, stainless steel cutleries are quite heavier. They are denser or they are heavier. They have the weight as compared to the other forms of cutlery. Number two, we go to bronze. Bronze. And the compositions of bronze include copper and then tin. Copper and tin all right now the property of bronze is that they are always brownish in color or in appearance they look brownish brownish all right and they are also used for making ornaments and they can also be used for making medals coins school bells church bells among other things and all these are some of the uses of bronze so this is how a metal or an alloy called bronze is. So this is how it looks like. It's a typical example of a bronze ornament. And these ones actually were very common in the ancient Roman Empire, you know, because they were so engrossed or they were so into some of these things because of the way they had to fight to win other territories and all that. These ones were very, very common during those ages or those times. Then we go to the third one, which is also known as dual lumen. Dual lumen. And when you see dual lumen, there is a particular name or the name of an element that actually adds up to the alloy dual lumen, which I know you can just guess, which is called aluminium. So one of the main compositions of dual lumen is aluminium. We have copper and then we have manganese. Now, what are some of the properties of dual lumen? One is that they have low density. They, they do not also corrode. They are stronger than pure aluminum. Like I said earlier, whenever you have an alloy and then another different metal or a pure metal, it is obvious that the alloy will have the or tensile strength or be able to uh, react or withstand conditions that will avail themselves in terms of rusting more than the pure metal because it has been added with something so it means that the strength of the alloy is more than the, the individual strength of one particular element on its own and then the aluminum is commonly or purposely used for the building of aircraft ship railway coaches among other things now like we said or like we just saw in one of the properties it has low density so due to this property, that is why they are mostly used in making of shapes and aeroplanes. Because when an aeroplane is made up of iron, which is very heavy, how do you think the aeroplane can just fly? It won't. Because of the heaviness of the metal that was made from. But on the other hand, aluminium and other things are quite not so heavy as compared to dual lumen 
And this is also a clear example of dual lumen. This is a clear example of dual lumen. This is how it looks like. So it can be used for medals and uh, other objects. Then we go to the fourth alloy, which is called brass. Now the composition of brass is copper and zinc. Copper and zinc. The properties of brass include it always has a golden appearance and then they do not also corrode. Have you ever wondered why the inside of every sardine looks golden? Have you ever wondered why? Now, whatever you have in there as gold is as a result of zinc. Remember, as the fishes are kept in the cans. There is a presence of a metal. There is a presence of water. And definitely, as you want to cover it up, there will be air in there. So as we go on, I will explain to you why zinc must be used in coating the inner walls of the cans for a reason which we will know later. Now, some of the uses of brass include uh, making of musical instruments, for making small fittings, doors, and also for making ornaments. Now let's go to some of the merits or advantages of alloys over pure metals. Now one, alloys are harder than pure metals. So every alloy is not just any other metal. It's like two strengths of individual components being brought together as one. So the strength of an alloy obviously will be more than the individual metals. Two, alloys have higher tensile strength than metals. Three, metals have higher ability to res resist corrosion better than pure metal. So it means that alloys are able to resist corrosion and rusting more than the individual components of the metals. Now let's go to a different subtopic called corrosion or corrosion of metals. When we say metal is corroding, what does that mean? Because this term is not commonly used. We mostly see that, or we mostly hear that, oh, the metal is rusting, or the metal has rusted. We will now know the difference between what corrosion is and then what rusting is. Corrosion of metal is the gradual wearing off of the surface of a metal due to chemical reactions between metal and environment. So corrosion of metal simply means the wearing away of the surface of the metal due to chemical reaction between that metal and its environment. The environment here is talking about where that metal finds itself. It can be outside, it can be in a room, it can be in a water, it can be in a drum or anywhere. So that is the environment in which that metal finds itself. It can also be defined as a process in which metal wear away at the surface through chemical activity when they are exposed. So when metals are also exposed, their surfaces also wear off. And this is a result of the chemical react, uh, activity of that. And also, this also has to do with the environment in which that metal also finds itself. Now, what are some of the processes of corrosion? When metals are exposed to atmospheric oxygen, water, aqueous acids, aqueous acids here means that any acids that is in the form of water or that is soluble in water. So when you have any acid in water, then it becomes aqueous acid. Alkaline or salt. They attack the metals by forming a hydrated metallic oxide layer on the surface of the metal. Let me take it again. When metals are exposed to atmospheric oxygen, water, aqueous acids, alkaline or salt, they attack the metals by forming a hydrated metallic oxide layer on the surface of the metal. So whenever these acids or an acid is exposed to, whenever any metal is exposed to any acid, any salt, any water, or any air, that is what actually happens to it. There's always a dry layer on the surface of the metal. That is why when you wash your cutlery or let's say you wash your dishes and then fortunately or unfortunately you use say a metal plate, which is actually it's not common though, and you don't actually wipe it with a napkin and then you leave it overnight. 
when you get up the next morning to see the plate, you see that there will be traces of water that has been dried on the metal plate or on the cutlery. That is because corrosion is gradually trying to take place. Corrosion is gradually trying to take place. So as the water dries on it and the presence of air and the metal is also availing itself, then there will be hydrated form of the metal on the surface. And then with time, as it goes, it goes on and on, something else will happen to it. In this process, the metal is eating away Yeah, when this happens, it means that gradually the surface of the metal is then eaten away by the presence of these conditions that will always allow corrosion to occur. And these ones are the metal itself, atmospheric oxygen, and obviously water. Atmospheric oxygen simply means that it's air. Air. Okay. And when it happens, this is what actually starts or begins the whole process. Now, you see a metal and then with time it now graduates or moves on further from it being white into different colors and before you realize the whole substance or the whole metal corrodes it corrodes now let's look at some of the factors that will promote corrosion what are some of the conditions that will actually make corrosion um, prevalent or that will induce corrosion one of it is air oxygen and then we have moisture which is also water and then we have acid alkaline chemicals or salt so when you have all these three present then definitely there will be corrosion but the common ones that will always avail themselves is atmospheric oxygen water and then the metal itself and the metal itself that is why houses that are very close to the sea actually uh, have roofing sheets actually corroding or turning into brownish color at a very very early stage of the roofing sheet's life because of the presence of salt as the wind blows and then carry a bit of the water onto the roofing sheet remember what happens is that due to the presence of the salt in the water with time the whole roofing sheet turns or to the color change its color from it being lustrous into brownish and then before you realize the whole thing is actually wearing off or moving away from the top of the burden now let's go to some of the effects of corrosion one acid rain corrodes the paint of buildings acid rain corrodes the paint of buildings what is an acid rain when you say acid rain what does that mean acid rain simply means that as it rains, you know, pure water or water from the atmosphere is supposed to be pure. So as it descends or comes down onto the earth surface or onto our houses, definitely due to some of the activities like bush burning, fumes from exhaust of cars, smoking and all that, they settle on top of the roofing sheet. And when this pure water or raining water comes into contact with this smoke and all these, then we say that acid rain has been obtained or formed so they or actually corrodes the paint of buildings and then all dry cells corrode the metal container of electric torches so when you have old dry cells they also corrode the metal container of electric torches and then skin toning creams corrode the faces and bodies of users i know you're laughing at this one yes um people buy um toning creams because they want to be light skin they say they want to tone their skins and other other things and as you are actually changing from who you are into a different thing then it means that you're actually corroding your skin so that is also that now what then is rusting rusting is the gradual wearing or peeling off of the surface of iron due to the reaction of oxygen in the presence of moisture so it simply means that rusting will always occur when there is iron when there is water and then when there is air so these three things are the main themes underlying rusting with corrosion any other metal goes through corrosion except iron but when we talk about rusting rusting has to do with only iron so when we say that this this thing is actually corroding we should actually make sure that item we're talking about is not iron if it is not iron, then we are on the right path. But if it's iron, 
we can't say it's cooling, but we can say that it is resting. And this is a clear example of ion chains that has undergone or that has gone through rusting. So you can see the other layer of it being shiny and nice. And then now, because it is getting rusted or going through the same process of rusting, the color is now changing from it being what we see here to the brownish nature. Now, let's go to the process of rusting. When iron is exposed to atmospheric ox oxygen or air, the water, no, when iron is exposed to atmospheric air and water, the iron reacts with both oxygen and water to form hydrated iron three oxide substance. So that is how it starts. Hydrated iron three substance. So that is when the iron has water on it and then the wind or air around, the water will dry because of the air or the wind the water will dry on the iron and then it forms hydrated iron 3 oxide the substance formed on the surface of the iron is powdery reddish brown in color the hydrated iron 3 oxide formed on the iron is known as rust rust is a form of corrosion in which iron is the only metal involved so when we talk about rusting the only metal involved here is iron. The hydrated iron 3 oxide or reddish brown formed on the surface of the iron gradually peels off, further releasing the bare surface of iron to atmospheric oxygen and water, making the iron finally to become weak. And then break, it breaks down. So it first makes it very weak, and then water still moves in there to get into it more, and then just get every inner part of it rusted and then before you realize it starts just falling off by itself let's go to the chemical equation for rusting so whenever we talk about chemical equation for rusting we need a thematic image that must always be present and these are the iron atmospheric oxygen and then water. these are the three main themes that must be present and here we have our hydrogen um oxygen gas as o2 and then we have our fe as our ion and then we have the presence of water and that is giving us all right so the two main conditions necessary for rusting are the moisture and then the air which is called the water and then the oxygen so these are the conditions that will always allow rusting to occur in the presence of ion now let's go to an experiment to demonstrate the process of rusting. Now experiment, what are we going to look out for? Or what are the materials that we need in science? We call them apparatus. So here we'll need our iron nails. We also need three tubes. We have our water and then we have our oil. Then we also have our calcium chloride. We have our rubber tubing and then we have our cotton wool. So we have three different test tubes. We have test tube one test tube 2 and test tube 3. In the first test tube, we have a nail inside the test tube and then we poured water on the nails and then we allowed air to go into the test tube and then the test tube 1 has been covered. It's been sealed up with the rubber tubing. When we come to test tube 2, now we have our nail inside, which is the iron nail in the test tube 2. The water here has been boiled and I will tell you why the water has been boiled. And then we have oil on top of the water. And then the whole tube has also been covered. Then we go to the test tube 3. Whereby we have our iron nail in the test tube. We have calcium chloride. We have our dry air. And then the whole test tube has also been covered. So when you look at these three things, what you will be all your observation for about three days now you have test tube one test tube two test tube three whereby test tube one contains iron nail and then we have our water we have our air and then test tube one has been covered test tube two we have our water we have the water actually has been boiled we have our iron nail and then we have oil on top of the water and then that one too is covered test tube three we have our calcium chloride and then dry air in test tube 3 
that also contains iron nail, and then that one too is covered. So with these three test tubes for three days, what will be your observation? Test tube one. It would be observed after that, the three days, that the test tube one iron nails would have rust on them. Why? Why? Because the conditions necessary for rusting to occur are all present in test tube one. And these conditions are the iron is there, we have water as the moisture, and then we have our almighty air. So th these conditions are all present in test tube one. Test tube two. In the second test tube, the water has been boiled to get rid of air. So as you boil water, then air in the water is actually made to move away out of the water. So because of that, we have the water boiled in test tube two, and then we have oil on top of the water. The oil here is preventing any extra or any addition of air from moving from the environment or surroundings into the test tube. So the layer of the oil wouldn't allow any, any presence of air to get into it. And because the water here also boiled, there wouldn't be any presence of rust. Why? Because even though we have our iron nail present, we have our water present, we don't have any air. And if we don't have any air, then it means that this test tube 2 cannot, or the nail in test tube 2 cannot go through rust. Test tube 3. In the test tube 3, there is no presence of water or moisture, and the calcium chloride absorbs any moisture or water that will be present. So in test tube 3, as you can all see, we have our iron nails, we have our calcium chloride, and then we have our dry air. So in test tube 3, there is the absence of water, and the calcium chloride here is actually dissolving or it's a drying agent actually that is trying to get rid of any extra moisture that may find itself into the test tube so if you have air that is good if you have iron nail that is present and then you don't have water there is no way that there will be rusting taking place in test tube three so in conclusion it can be concluded that rusting will only occur in test tube one because it has all conditions that will allow rusting to occur and that is because in test tube one, we have our air, we have our water, and then we have our iron nail. So test tube one is the only experiment or test tube in which all the conditions for rusting are availing themselves or are present. All the other ones, when you look at two, air is absent because the water has been boiled. When you look at the last one, test tube three, Water is also absent because calcium chloride will also serve as a drying agent and then absorb any moisture or water present. All right. Now we go to assessment. I would always give you a few questions for you to try your hands on. So one, what is an alloy? You explain to me what an alloy is. Two, state three alloys and give their compositions, properties, and uses. Three is explain the terms rusting and corrosion. So I want you to give me the, the, the differences between rusting, what is rusting, and then what is corrosion. And then number four, you list the conditions that will allow rusting to okay. Conditions that will allow rusting to okay. All right. Now let me give you a recap of the whole thing. I said that we today we learned about alloys. Now what's an alloy? An alloy is a mixture of two metals being brought together or a metal and a non-metal. Before you can have two metals or a metal and a non-metal together, it's not a matter of you getting two different objects. This is the metal, this is another metal They're together. No, you must always get them in their molten state. So it means they must first be heated to get them in a the liquid form. As you can all see from this as you can all see from this good as the metal or the non-metals are just heated for several hours you now get them in their molten state this way and then at this stage you can bring the two different metals or the non-metal and the metal together you stay so well so that they mix properly 
and then you have your alloy. Some of the examples of alloys that we spoke about are stainless steel, we also spoke about brass, we spoke about um, bronze, and then duralumin. When we talk about stainless steel, the composition are iron, chromium, and then carbon. And then stainless steel has a property of not undergoing through rusting. They do not rust because they have the strength to withstand rust for longer periods of time. They are used for making surgical equipment and also for on an ornament. The examples of stainless steel are what have been displayed here as your cutlery and then the other ornament that you see here. Then we have bronze that can also be made from copper and tin. And then bronze actually look brownish in color. And they are used for making ornaments. They are also used for making medals, coins, school bells, church bells, among other things. And this example of bronze. Then we have duralumin that is also used in the making of aircraft, ships, railway coaches, and then other things. And the decomposition of duralumin include aluminium itself, copper, and the manganese. And they have low density. They are not as heavy as iron. And they do not also corrode. And then they are stronger than pure aluminium. And this is how it also looks like. Then we have brass, which also is made from copper and then zinc. So copper and zinc is always used in the making of brass. I said I'll tell you the reason why... The inner walls of sardines are golden or they look goldish more than the other ones. It's because of the presence of zinc. Zinc is used in the, co in the coating of the inner walls of the empty cans. As they coat it that way, they prevent the direct contact of the, of the metal itself. And then the, whatever they will pour into the content or whatever they will be poured into the container. For example, when you have your sardine sauce and your sardine and all that, as you pour whatever, the fish and then the sauce in the container, without the zinc, then it means that there's going to be a reaction between the metal and then the sauce because the sauce is in the form of liquid. And the metal will always come together because definitely, as you want to even cover it up, a bit of air will go through it. Yes, so the inner walls are always coated with zinc to prevent rusting and that is what is called galvanization or galvanizing so the zinc has been used to galvanize the inner walls to prevent that then we spoke about some alloys or the properties of alloys over pure metals alloys are harder than pure metals alloys have the ability to resist corrosion than pure metals and they also have higher tensile strength so in most cases alloys are used in the building of uh, bridges in bridges because if you want to have banisters on a bridge they mostly use the alloys because whenever there should be even presence of water and other things because it is in the upper layer it's going to help for it to resist or withstand rusting for longer periods of time and then we have corrosion of metals whereby is the gradual wearing away of the surface of a metal due to the chemical reaction of the metal and then its environment the environment here is talking about water, presence of water, presence of air or um, oxygen, and then the metal itself. And then we also spoke about some of the processes of corrosion, whereby the metals are always exposed to atmospheric oxygen, water, aqueous acids, alkaline or salt, whereby they attack and they deform a hydrated ion 3 oxide on top of the metal. As you can all see here. Now, what are some of the factors that promote corrosion? Some of the factors that promote corrosion include air, uh, which is oxygen, moisture, or water, and then we have acid, alkaline, chemicals, or salt. So, any building, any high rise building that is very close to the sea will actually uh, more or less uh, lose its luster in terms of the roofing sheet, if only. It's, um, the roofing sheet that has, that has been used is aluminium. It will use it last time because of the presence of the salt in the water. So as the wind blows from the seaside and then come onto the roofing sheet, a bit of the deposition of water will be left on the roofing sheet and over time there will be corrosion 
happening or the whole roofing sheet will be corroded. What factors will always, what are some of the effects of corrosion when it happens? So we have acid rain, which corrodes the paintings of buildings. We have skin toning cream that also corrodes the faces and bodies of users. Old dry salts corrode the metal container of electric torches and that. And then we also spoke about rusting, whereby it occurs only in the presence of iron, moisture, and then air. And this is a clear example of that, as you can all see. And the process of iron is that when all these present are available, then it means that hydrated iron 3 oxide is produced on top of the surface of the metal. And then now we also had a clear picture of a nice process of rusting, whereby you need um, oxygen, gas, and then the iron itself and water. So these are the reactants, and then they come together, and then they form what is called rust. Rust. The conditions that are necessary for rusting include the metal itself. And the metal here is always iron. The moisture, which is the water, and then the air. Okay, so we also spoke about an experiment to demonstrate the presence of rust, whereby we have three different test tubes. Test tube 1, test tube 2, test tube 3. And then in each test tube, we had iron nail. Then the first test tube, we had water, we had air, we had the iron nail. And then the whole thing was covered by rubber tubing. Second one, we had the iron nail, we had boiled water, and then we had oil on top of the boiled water. The third one, we had iron nail, we had calcium chloride, and then we had dry air. Now, in this three test tube, it was realized that it was test tube one that rustling occurred because there's a presence of water or moisture presence of air, and then presence of iron. And that always brings us to the end of today's lesson. So again, I display the assessment for today as what's an alloy, first question, three alloys and give their compositions, properties, and uses. And then explain rusting and corrosion. Last but not the least is you give me the conditions that will allow rusting to okay. So these are the assessment that will, I expect you to find answers to for the next season. Now, when I meet you the next time, I will go, we'll go through all this and then find solutions to them. If you are done with your answers, please submit them to Joy Learning platforms. And then I'll see it, mark your script, and then I'll mention the one who made history by getting all the questions right. So I meet you again. I am still your science facilitator. My name is Opoku. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.